This video focuses on forming and testing adaptive hypotheses. We'll then go into talking about phenotypic plasticity, the idea that an, an adaptation itself might be flexible such that it can exist in different contexts uh, in different ways. Then we'll end the discussion of adaptations by talking about why adaptations might not be perfect or why they might not evolve entirely. Let's first review the link between natural selection and adaptation, and then we're going to move into talking about how we can form hypotheses of, of adaptive evolution and test them scientifically. So we've talked about the various mechanisms of evolution, and not all of evolution can be explained by natural selection. So there are other mechanisms that are involved. But adaptations can only be explained by natural selection. There's a clear link between these. So an adaptation generally is described as a selectively advantageous trait for a given situation. This means that the trait improves the relative fitness of the individuals that have that trait. So if you have the trait, you're going to have greater fitness than those individuals that don't have the trait. But saying that a trait is selectively advantageous has to be linked to a very specific environmental challenge. So in this example, there are two moths one of which is probably not very easy for you to see. This is an example of two different morphs of the salt and pepper moths. This morph right here on this background is actually adaptive. In this situation, the melanistic form is not adaptive. It's going to be more likely seen by a potential predator. However, in this environment, now we have the reverse. The salt and pepper morph is more likely to stand out to a predator and get uh, eaten. In this case, the melanistic form is the adaptive morphology. It has the selective advantage and individuals with these alleles that produce this phenotype are going to have higher fitness. So it's very important to think about a trait as an adaptation only being an adaptation given a specific environmental circumstance. So as scientists, we have to test hypotheses. We have to take a scientific approach to understand some biological phenomena. So if we're going to have some assumption about a trait being an adaptation, we have to form a hypothesis that's testable and falsifiable. And in some cases, those hypotheses are, are pretty obvious. So eyes are clearly adaptive for forming vision. For other traits, the selective advantage may not be quite as readily apparent. But again, you have to form a hypothesis and you have to test that. It's very important that hypotheses, even when they're obvious, shouldn't be just so stories. Meaning we don't just assume by forming a hypothesis and saying, oh, that's pretty much clearly what we think it's going to be. You still have to, to test it. A just so story is the idea that you form a hypothesis and you're so convinced that it's right that you don't test it. That's bad science. So a hypothesis must be testable and you have to test it. Let me give you an example of that. So the birds on this ox are what are called ox peckers. And they uh, land on a variety of large mammals. And the idea that's been proposed is, is that this is a mutualistic relationship. So that's our hypothesis here. Um, the birds, uh, the idea is the birds are removing parasites from the mammals. So they're getting food associated with this and then they're removing the parasites from these large mammals and their benefit from that parasite removal. So, it seems pretty obvious to people that take a casual look at uh, these birds uh, interacting with these large mammals that that's what's going on. And for a long time, that was just assumed to be what was going on. But if you actually collect data to test the hypothesis, you can see that there's really something else going on. The birds spend most of their time feeding on wounds on the cattle, not removing ticks. So here's a study that was designed to test what's really going on here, to test our, our original hypothesis that this has something to do with removal of ticks from these ox versus alternative hypotheses that there's something else going on here. So this is a really simple uh, study in which they took uh, several herds of cattle and they broke them into a couple of treatments in, pair, in a paired design. So one group of cattle, in this case eight, uh, individuals, they hired a kid to run around and any time an ox pecker would land on one of the cattle, they'd scare them off with a stick. So th this was the 
no oxpecker treatment. In another area nearby, there's another herd of 11 cows in which they just let them do the, the regular thing, right? Um, the oxpeckers were there. So they had these six different treatments in this paired design, and they wanted to look at the change in the tick load after a month. And what you can see here is sometimes the tick load went down. But sometimes it went down when the oxpeckers were there. Sometimes it went down when the oxpeckers were ex actually excluded. Sometimes when the oxpeckers were on the cattle, the ticks went up. So there's no clear pattern here. And given that there is no clear pattern, we don't see support for the hypothesis. So this hypothesis can be rejected. What about alternative hypotheses? Well, as I mentioned, uh, other researchers have noticed that what they're really doing is they're feeding on the wounds of these uh, cattle, and they're actually even creating them. I mean, their names are ox peckers. So this is more really a parasitic relationship, not a mutualistic relationship, and the data support this. You see that when you exclude the ox peckers by the kid running around scaring them off, the cattle actually have fewer wounds over a, uh, the same period of time that the ox peckers were allowed to land on the cattle. So they're actually causing these wounds on which they're feeding on the, the cattle's tissue. Sometimes when you do a study, um, you collect data that wasn't necessarily associated with your original hypotheses, but it leads to the formation of new hypotheses that those data can test. And in this situation, one of the things that you see is that the, the cattle show differences in the amount of earwax they had depending on the treatment that they were in. So when you removed the ox peckers from being uh, able to get access to them, uh, they developed more earwax. Now, the effect of this, whether it's beneficial to the cattle or, or harmful to the cattle, isn't known. But it just does show you that there is another interaction between these two species. So that's a simple example of how you can test a hypothesis of, of adaptation. We're going to talk about some other methods for testing uh, adaptive hypotheses, but before we get to that, I want to talk about some terminology that you might run across sometimes. Some biologists refer to a selectively advantageous trait differently depending on whether it's the original function of that trait or if the trait has been modified from its original function to serve an additional selectively advantageous trait. So these terms differ in depending on if you demonstrate that the trait is selectively advantageous, you call it an adaptation if it is, has evolved in the context of that very specific function and it's retaining this original function. So an adaptation is a selectively advantageous trait that's evolved in the context of its original function. However, sometimes certain traits may be pre-adapted for other functions and it may be modified slightly or, or really not change, but it assumes a new function. We call this then an exaptation. It still may retain its original adaptive function, or it may have lost that adaptive function, but this is just when we talk about a trait that's evolved for one reason continuing into another function, its exaptive role. It may be selectively advantageous for a new function. So let's give you an example. So um, northern cardinals are bright red in coloration. And I don't know which of these is the original adaptation versus the exaptive function, but I'm just going to kind of give you an example um, if we could track this down. Let's say that the original adaptive function of this was male-male combat. So brighter males were signaling to male intruders, don't mess with me, this is my territory. And so the original adaptive function may have been male-male competition. Secondarily, perhaps, females started using the different coloration among males to choose which male was the highest quality and which male that they should mate with. And so the secondary exaptation for this became a display to females to entice them to mate. So the, the coloration really may not have changed, but it may have originally evolved for one adaptive function and also be selectively advantageous for a secondary exaptive function. Feathers in general, you could put them in this context. The original ad adaptive function for feathers was likely for warmth, perhaps communication as well, but probably thermal regulation. If you look at the original feathers, early feathers in some of the early 
uh, dinosaur lineages that had these little fuzzy feathers, uh, it, it really makes sense that that is most likely a thermal advantage that they had. You don't see the evolution of complex flight surface generating feathers until uh, later evolution. So in this case, the feathers themselves, as they become modified and take on this new ex exaptive function, structurally they are changing as they uh, become uh, more and more selectively advantageous for this secondary function. And here's kind of a silly example, but um, when I was finishing up my graduate work, I actually already got this job here at SFA, and I was thinking of lectures that I was going to do for evolution, and I was thinking about how to explain uh, exaptations versus adaptations, and I was doing some field work in Thailand. And in Thailand, males uh, of a certain age have to do one of two things. They either have to join the military for a number of years, or serve um, as a novice in um, a Buddhist uh, temple. And one of the traditions that they have is every morning they would get up and uh, carry these alms pots and they would walk along the highway or walk along the roads uh, between villages and uh, the Buddhist temples that they were living at. And they would go from house to house to get food. And uh, people would put food in these, but they'd have to walk every morning for their food to break their fast. And I thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm really glad they're so visible because they have traditionally these uh, kind of hunter orange robes. And so I started doing some research about that, and it turns out the original reason that they do that, so you might consider it like the, the original adaptation for this coloration, has some religious significance. Um, I can't remember exactly what that was, but there is a religious reason in this Buddhist uh, group why they wear this specific color robe. Secondarily, exaptive, it's really efficient if you're going to be walking along uh, roads where, where people are driving really fast so that you don't get hit by cars, um, especially if you're walking next to an American uh, because in Thailand, you're on the wrong side of the road. You're driving on the left side of the road, and when you're in the car, you're in the uh, right-hand seat. The driver's seat is the right hand not versus the left hand. And so for people like me, yeah, I was struggling to drive sometimes, especially if a standard shifting, you know, with your left hand. It definitely probably was a good idea for them to be really obvious so that uh, I didn't run over them. So it's important for you to just realize that sometimes if you see the term exaptation, it's talking about a selectively advantageous trait that's, a, that's had this secondary uh, functionality. But in a lot of cases, people talk about an adaptation simply as a trait that is selectively advantageous and really aren't making a distinction between if it's the original function or if it's taken on a new function. And in, in the remaining sections uh, of this lecture and in future lectures, I'll generally use the term adaptation simply to mean something that's selectively advantageous. All right, so let's get into how, as a scientist, you could test hypotheses associated with uh, adaptation. Well, the first thing you have to do is uh, you've got to form that hypothesis. And to do that, you have to ask a relevant question about some biological phenomenon that you have. And looking at biological phenomenon with a new set of eyes, being open-minded is a particularly important way of advancing science. In fact, having a healthy disrespect for conventional wisdom, questioning things, is, is actually healthy. So, for example, in the Oxpecker example, the idea that really they may not be in a mutualistic relationship helped to advance what was really going on in that, that uh, biological interaction. And this is what keeps science healthy. It's important that hypotheses and theories have to constantly undergo challenges. Um, that's what keeps science honest. And ironically, if you want to make a big name for yourself in science, you want to radically change the way we uh, think about something. If science was kind of leading us down this one road, but it seemed a little uncertain, and you come up with a reason why there wasn't clarity there, by changing drastically the way we think about something, that is how to advance science and your own career. We call those types of radical ways that we change our view on something a paradigm shift. So the concept of evolution proposed by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace itself was a paradigm shift, how we viewed biological diversification. 
All right, so let's talk about how you actually form hypotheses and test them. Well, the first thing you gotta do is have the background knowledge about your organism. You have to just be a good biologist, broadly trained, and that's why you're getting a degree in uh, biological sciences so that you can have that background knowledge. And then just spend a lot of time with your organism, trying to, to learn as much as you can about that organism, making detailed observations. And what you will find is as you test hypotheses, form hypotheses and test them, they will bring up additional questions. So the more you know, the more questions you also derive. So um, that's been my experience with this bird right here, the blue-tailed bee-eater. It's, it's a species that we studied. We started off wanting to understand its uh, cooperative breeding behavior, but that led to other types of, of studies about brood parasitism and habitat choice. So that's, that's how good science works. It builds on previous knowledge. Now I want to talk about three different approaches that you as a scientist can use to test adaptive hypotheses. The first is called op using the observational method. Then we'll talk about how you can use experimental manipulations. And these two can be found in other fields of science. But the third, the comparative methods, really is restricted uh, almost entirely to evolutionary biology. So we're going to give an example of each of these. But one thing that they all share in common is sample size is crucial to have a good outcome in, in all studies. You have to have a large sample size so that you can make sure that you're getting an accurate pattern of what normally happens in nature despite the occasional uh, atypical data point. If you have a low sample size and you have a couple of atypical data points in there, it could radically change your conclusions. A large sample size also allows you to apply certain statistical methods to really quantify the level of support you have for rejection of a hypothesis or failing to reject that hypothesis. So it allows us to, to bring in some mathematical tests to take away subjectivity and give us objective criteria to say, yes, I can reject this hypothesis or not. When you have low sample sizes, you can't apply these methodologies. All right, so let's first go through an example of an observational method. And I'm gonna use the idea of thermal preferences and behavioral homeotherm in ectotherms. So homeotherms, like you, mammals and birds, we can maintain activity despite changes in the environment because we are able to regulate our body temperatures around a, a very small range it's, that's around our thermal preference. Body temperature is important for maintaining your ability to have certain efficiencies and our ability to maintain a, a relatively uh, small range around our thermal preferences make us pretty efficient regardless of what the outside temperature is. If you're an ectotherm, you got some problems there though. Um, there are certainly temperatures in which you're most efficient, and that's what this figure right here is showing. You see that, uh, that for endurance, for burst speed, for digestion, for hearing efficiency, certainly this temperature seems to be the best performance. So relative performance of each of these tasks is shown here. You're maximizing your performance, usually for all of these around this temperature right here. So just, you know, in the high 30s uh, degrees Celsius, so pretty warm. These data were collected in a laboratory. So you can, so for example, you can put lizards on little treadmills and, and test their endurance. You can check their burst speed um, by startling them at different temperatures. And so these are data that are collected in a, a laboratory. This right here, however, is data that's associated with where you just see lizards in the field at what temperatures uh, do you see them. And you see that they tend to be found more at temperatures associated with what has been determined in the laboratory to be their thermal preference. So this is interesting because I just said these are ectotherms. They can't physiologically control their temperature. So how are they maintaining these, this relatively small range around this thermal preference? Well, one hypothesis for how they would do this is that they're using behavioral homeothermy. Behavioral homeothermy indicates that these ectotherms, lizards and snakes, what they do is they move among different thermal areas. The microhabitat in the habitat that they live in has uh, variable temperatures. 
And what they do is they just move from small location to small location depending on the temperature, always seeking the environmental area that is at that thermal preference. And so if they do that, then they can maintain an optimal body temperature. So that's our hypothesis, that these ectotherms are selecting microhabitats that have the preferred temperature range. And that's how they maintain their optimal temperature for optimal uh, efficiency in their physiology and behavior. So one of the things you can do is you can put radio transmitters that have uh, thermal capabilities in uh, snakes. And so here's one snake, here's a second snake, and you basically just track throughout a day, so here's a daytime period, where they are and what their temperature is. So here we see that, that this snake has gone in, at night, has gone underground or, or under a rock, and it's gradually losing temperature. But then in the morning, when the sun starts to come out, they come above ground, they get warm to maintain their thermal warmth, and then it gets too hot, so they go back underground. But they will so, show you in a minute that, uh, sorry, not underground, but under a rock, they're picking rocks that allow them to stay within this preferred temperature range. The TPs is talking about that uh, preferred temperature range that we established in the lab. CT max means they get higher than this for a sustained period of time, they die. CT minimum is the, the minimum temperature that, that could kill these snakes. All right, so here's another snake. This snake basically just stayed under a rock the whole time, but still was able to maintain a pretty close match to its, its thermal preference. Well, now let's look at the microhabitat characteristics where these snakes are living. So under thin rocks, there's, thin rocks are not going to be good. There's only a small time period during the day, kind of late morning when they're within that thermal range, and in the evening when they're in that thermal range. During the day, they're way too hot. During the nighttime, they're way too cold. So that's important to realize. This kind of indicates you wouldn't see snakes under these thin rocks very often because they're just not at the right temperature. Let's jump down to thick rocks. Thick rocks, they're too cool throughout the day, day and night. So you really wouldn't expect them here. Let's look at medium rocks. This is kind of like a Goldilocks story. These medium rocks do a pretty good job standing around this preferred temperature range. And the position you are at this rock can change throughout the day as, as to how close it is to this thermal maximum. So sometimes the south edge gets too warm um, but look at the, the uh, east edge. East edge is really good at staying there most of the time. But if you're under this rock, you can even, a medium-sized rock, you can shift your position to, to maintain where you're going to be able to stay at that uh, preferred temperature range. Burrows, sometimes burrows are good, so especially at about five centimeters deep. That's, if you see one in a burrow, that's where you should probably see it most of the time. If you're too shallow, it's going to be too hot, too deep too cold. Above ground, if you're exposed during the day, you're probably going to get too hot. In the shade, you're pretty good. So if you're not going to find one of these snakes under a medium-sized rock, probably a good chance that you're going to see them in the shade somewhere um, that matches that thermal preference during the uh, afternoon hours. So this builds our map of the thermal environment and gives us the idea of where we should expect to see these snakes. And if you look at the rock availability in the habitat, it's about evenly split between thin rocks, medium rocks, and thick rocks, about a third each. But if you actually look where the snakes are, they're much more likely to be found at these medium rocks. And that's exactly what we expected, right? And you can actually use a chi-square test like we did for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to show that despite the fact that the medium rocks are only represented by a third, they're almost two-thirds of the chance that the snake is going to be there. So this is uh, highly significant. The snakes are using medium rocks above and beyond their availability in the habitat. This matches our expectations for our hypothesis that they're using behavioral homeothermy. They're selectively choosing to be under these medium-sized rocks because that keeps them at their thermal preference. So these are data in support of that hypothesis of behavioral homeothermy. All right, let's move on to give an example of an experimental test. And this is one of my favorite experiments of all time. It uh, is going to 
to show you the function of wing displays and wing patterns into fritted fruit flies. These flies have these really cool uh, banding patterns on these clear wings. And additionally, these flies will wave these wings under certain conditions when they're disturbed. The idea is that they're doing this because of this individual right here. Notice that this jumping spider also has these nice black patterns on its legs. That's going to be important here in a minute. So if you look at the spider from the front and the fly from behind, you get this. From behind, these flies look kind of like they've got spider legs. And the idea is that these flies are mimicking jumping spiders to scare off a predator. Particularly by waving these wings, it looks like a jumping spider that's raising up its, its legs about to pounce. So, one hypothesis we're going to see is that there, this is mimicry to scare off some type of predator. A secondary hypothesis is that it's specifically to scare off the jumping spider itself. Because jumping spiders um, are sometimes each other's worst enemies. They will kill and eat each other. So when you test a hypothesis, if you can think ahead of time to frame behavioral phenomenon associated with several hypotheses, it allows you to design a study where you can collect data to test multiple hypotheses at the same time. And so in this case, uh, the first hypothesis, and really I should have this as a H0, because this is describing what we call the null hypothesis. And the idea is that this has nothing to do with mimicry. So the flies are not mimicking spiders and has, it's totally unrelated to predation. That's one possibility. But really what we're hypothesizing based upon uh, our uh, educated guess of, of what spiders do and how they can be afraid of each other um, and that they these flies may be targeted oftentimes by spiders, that the flies are mimicking spiders to deter some type of predator. Sometimes it may be a non-spider predator. The third hypothesis here is, however, that it's specifically evolved in the context of spider predation. So both of these are related. They're basically saying there's to scare off a predator, but it, what is that predator? Is it a spider or is it some non-spider? So let me walk you through the experiment here. Here's our tefritted fly, and you would put 20 of these individuals one at a time in an arena with a potential predator. Sometimes it was a, a jumping spider. Sometimes it was, was uh, some other type of predator of a, a fly. Here are expectations. If the null hypothesis is uh, there, that it's this has nothing to do with scaring off a predator, the jumping spider should attack, and whatever other predator that you use, some other predatory insect, it will attack, okay? Because this has nothing to do with preventing uh, predation. Under hypothesis number two, this is the one that, that says that it's this, this trait has evolved to scare off some type of predator besides jumping spider, then that predator should retreat. The jumping spider may not be fooled and may attack, but it still has some protection against other predators. Hypothesis three is just the reverse of this. It may not really help other predators, but boy, does it really help against jumping spiders. The jumping spiders are, are afraid because it does look like another jumping spider. Well, what are you going to compare this to? Well, house flies are about the same size as these tefritted flies, but they lack two basic characteristics of the fruit fly. Notice there's no banding pattern in the wing. They're just clear wings. That's one aspect that we're testing here. The other aspect that we're testing is the movement of the wings. These flies also don't move their wings. They don't uh, raise them and, and move them in the same pattern as the fruit flies do. So in this situation, what we would expect, when you put these flies in the arena with either a jumping spider predator or some other predator, every single case they're going to be attacked. They have no protection against this. Now, if we want to really determine the impact of the two possible traits that are shown here separately, we have to disentangle them. So remember, the banding pattern may be important, but the waving of the wings may be important too. How are we going to, to disentangle those in this study? Well, we need two new groups in which we take fruit flies and an equal number of house flies. We cut off their wings and swap them. So see, what's happening here is now we're putting clear wings on a fruit fly, but he's going to wave those wings. 
Here we're putting banding patterns, banded wings, on housefly that's not going to wave those wings. So the idea here is if it takes both of these traits to, to prevent uh, the predator from attacking, that you have to have both of these, the, the movement and the, the pattern of the wings. If you just have one of them, you're going to get attacked in all these situations. So this should be a good test to see do you need both the components or is it good enough to just have one of the components compared to having none of the components. And you may be thinking, okay, I'm ready to do this study. If you did that, you wouldn't be able to publish this because you don't have one important group that you need in every experimental study, and that's what we call the experimental control. An experimental control is a group that tests the idea that your experimental manipulation itself may be so traumatic that it's, it's leading to some artificiality in your data. So you can imagine the potential in this case that cutting off the wings of a, a fly and then transplanting some other one, kind of making these Frankenstein flies, may affect their behavior. So they may be all killed, not because they only have one of the two traits, but because you freaked them out. You've given them, you've cut off part of their appendages um, and you've given them new ones. You've used glue to put these back on top of each other and maybe that glue is affecting their behavior. So there are a variety of things associated with this potential experimental manipulation that may make these flies not act normal and cloud the data that you gather here and cloud your interpretation of those data. So what is an experimental control that would help to control for these potential problems? Well, what you need to do is take another group of fruit flies, cut off their wings, and then just glue them right back on. So see, this group should look just like these at the end, but they literally did have their wings cut off and glued back on. So you're testing for the effect of the cutting, the manipulation itself, uh, and also for the glue. And if that really isn't having an effect, importantly, these two groups, A and B, should show very similar data. Maybe not exact, but they should be very similar. If you don't get similarity between these two groups, the unmanipulated control group and the experimental control group, then you can't, you just have to start over. You gotta throw the data away because it's, it's not good. Your experiment is, is tainted. So a control group makes sure that the experimental manipulation is not preventing a clear interpretation of the data. Very important. You have to have an experimental control group in any experiment. So this was a real study, and again, they used 20 trials for each of these categories, and these are, are some of the data. So let's first just look at the responses of jumping spiders when they were used at the predator, and a fly of one of these categories was put in there. In cases of A and B, when you have the fruit fly that has both the wing and the movement of the wing, 15 out of 20 cases, the spider retreated. In one case, here in B, before the trial ended, the spider did actually stalk and try to attack. And in, in a minority of cases, they, in the time period, they actually did attack and kill the fly. But, so it's not a guarantee that you're going to survive uh, if you're placed in front of a jumping spider, but your odds are pretty good. Now, how does that compare to C, D, and E? Well, if you just compare it to the fly here, we have a higher proportion of these flies that were eventually attacked and killed but in all cases, even if they weren't killed at the end, they were stalked and attacked. There was no evidence that there was any mimicry going on here that could provide some protection for these flies because they didn't have either of the traits. That's the same basic pattern for C and D. If you just have one of these traits, it really doesn't do you any good in the majority of cases. But look down here. In one out of these 20 trials, it did help. So maybe this spider was just kind of not very hungry or was really kind of a scaredy cat. Um, but this appears to be kind of the atypical response. And again, this is why you have to have a large sample size. If you just ran one spider through each of these trials, you may have taken that scaredy cat one in this trial, and that would have completely changed your interpretation of these data. You may have been saying, oh yeah, look, these do just as good as these. So having one of these traits is just as good. But by having a large sample of 20, you can see that, no, most of the time, these are going to be attacked and, and sometimes actually killed. And there's really no difference between these 
between having one of these traits and having none of the traits. And that's what these red bars are indicating, that there is no difference within these three, among these three, but as a group, they are different from these two over here, which there's no difference between those. So in this case, our data are consistent with hypothesis three. Now, if you start look at the data associated with uh, when you use the other predator, the other predator, regardless, just always attacked and killed. And they didn't even test uh, these uh, uh, two examples because the, the data were so clear here that this really was no effect. I mean, yes, they should have gone ahead and done these just for completion, but it was pretty clear that this wasn't going to have any support. Um, but there really is support for the hypothesis that these flies are using these two traits together to mimic a jumping spider. And there is some protection associated with that. So the third method that I want to go through is called the comparative method. And this provides an alternative to experimental examination of adaptive hypotheses and also observational methods. The key to comparative methods is we're looking for patterns of, of evolution and specifically patterns of independent convergent adaptations. So does the same adaptive trait evolve in the same circumstances in multiple cases in the evolutionary history of a lineage? And the more times we see the same trait evolve in the same circumstances, the stronger support we have for an adaptive link between those two. So again, sample size is key. But to be able to do this, to be able to tell how many times something has evolved, we have to map the pattern of evolution onto a phylogeny. So it's critical that you know that for comparative studies, you have to have a phylogeny. Just like in experimental studies, you have to have a control. So let's give you an example. So if you look at fruit bats, uh, different species live in different sized colonies. Some fruit bats live in these really large social groups. And it's been noticed that in those species, sometimes the males have really large testes. This makes sense when we talk about mate competition. Again, males are trying to pass on as many copies of their genes as possible. So one of the things that they want to do is mate with as many females as possible. And they have to compete with other males in the group uh, who may be also mating with those females. So this leads to what we call sperm competition among the males. Males that produce more sperm are more likely to father more of the offspring in these large groups that have lots of females. So there's a selective advantage to having large testes so that you can outcompete other males by in sperm production. And if we just look at different species and the number, the, the size of their group and the relative size of their testes, there appears to be a pretty strong correlation. So those that have really large groups tend to have relatively large testes. And I'm talking about relative testes size because these bats also differ in their body size. But if you control for body size and look at the relative testes size, those that have larger than normal testes tend to be those found in the large group. Those with smaller than, smaller than average testes size are those living in the small uh, groups or sometimes solitary breeders. In that example, we were using each species as an independent data point. And that's an important assumption if you're doing statistical methods. Each of your data points has to be independent. Well, if you look at the phylogeny of some groups, you may find that there are certain clusters, such as shown in this example. So species A, B, and C, they're really similar in their trait. Maybe they're the ones associated with small testes and small groups. And then we have these three species here, and they also um, share very similar testes size and similar group sizes. Well, what if the phylogeny looked like this? Can we really see, say, that A, B, and C are independent from each other, and D, E, and F are independent from each other? It's a reasonable explanation that the reason A, B, and C have this, the testy size that they have, because they inherited that from a common ancestor. D, E, and F have large testes, probably just because they inherited that from a common ancestor too. So instead of six data points, really we can have two. We still have the same pattern, right? But our confidence in this pattern is greatly reduced because we don't have as much independent support.
So by reducing the number of data points into these two main clusters, it makes us reconsider the strength of our support. So now we just have really two data points. So in this case, testes size may have as much to do with common ancestry as living in large versus small group sizes. So the kind of the take home message for this is biologies really have made us more cautious in identification of data points to test uh, adaptive hypotheses. So we have to come up with new methodologies to incorporate phylogenetic information. And one of these methods is called using phylogenetic independent contrast. So in this, what we can do is we can say, if this is the phylogeny, we need to find areas that are comparable. So from this common ancestor S, when this speciation event occurred, M had independent evolution from N. So that's a good comparison. Well, what about between O and S? Well, that common ancestor of these two, wherever it ended up, it had the same starting point at T as O did. So O and S, that's a good comparison. So each of these comparisons shown in the coloration here is shown their contrast in their group size and relative testes size here. Now, if you take each of these points and drag them to the origin, now we have corrected for phyl phylogenetic input and we're looking at the relative contrasts that have taken away the phylogenetic, that, that's incorporated the phylogenetic information so that we really are looking at statistically relevant comparisons because we have, we're just looking at from their common starting point what has happened in each of these so that they, that they are equal for their potential evolutionary possibilities. And here's real data. So if you look at the group size of different species of fruit bats and look at their body size and their testes mass, you see that this was the original data, just treating each species as an independent data point. But if you look, if you use this phylogeny to do phylogenetic independent contrast, you see the same pattern. So there are fewer dots here, but there's still enough to say, yes, we are confident now that given equal starting points, the evolutionary impact on testes size as it relates to, to group size, um, there really is something there, that, that this really is an adaptive situation when you control for the phylogenetic pattern. Okay, so now what I want to do is, is shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about adaptations as like their specific traits, and, and I did mention the importance of that trait being a good fit for a specific environmental circumstance. But what if the trait itself can change in different environments? Even if we've got the same genotype, the trait can change. Does that mean it's not heritable? No, not necessarily. The importance of the trait that's adaptive is its plasticity itself. So in some cases, the adaptive nature of a trait is its plasticity. So we call this phenotypic plasticity, the ability to produce a variable phenotype in different ecological situations. That in itself can be adaptive in certain circumstances. Here's an example of how phenotypic plasticity can be adaptive. If you look at phototactic behavior in Daphnia, you see that um, the behavior of showing uh, different responses to light in different environments is seen in some populations but not others. So in this situation what they did is they took clones of Daphnia because this is one of these species that can reproduce sexually and asexually and you take asexual clones and you look to see how these clones which are represent which are indicated by lines here. So you look at individual clonal individuals in a situation where in a laboratory where you see that uh, they're just in clean water and they tend to go more toward light. However, if you add a little bit of fish juice in here that indicates the, the presence of a potential predator, you see that they go to the darker areas of the tank. Okay, so each clonal line is responding basically in this way, some more strongly than others, but the overall trend is for them to respond in a, a negative uh, phototactic way. But this is from populations of Daphnia that were taken from a lake that had a high fish population. If you look at another lake that has a relatively low fish population, you see that clonal lines sometimes have that response, 
Sometimes they actually do the opposite, but in most cases, there's really not much of a difference in their phototactic behavior when they're just in fresh water versus uh, when they uh, have fish-induced uh, stimuli there. They just don't appear to be responding to that. So in, in this second case, they're really not showing any phenotypic plasticity. In the former case, there was strong phenotypic plasticity. Their behavior changed given the environmental circumstances. Now, if you then consider a situation where there's absolutely no fish in an area, uh, here you definitely don't see a pattern. It's just completely random. There's no real difference in behavior in clonal lineages where they uh, sense that there are fish versus not fish because it's just not something they're used to. So in this situation, phenotype plasticity is adaptive in that it allows individuals that were raised in lakes that had the potential for fish predators, which are visually oriented predators, to respond in an adaptive manner. They go to darker areas of the water so that they can reduce their chances of predation. And there's even evidence that this type of behavior can evolve within one lake. So what they did is, in this study, they took Daphnia from different time periods um, that have different predation pressures and tested them to see what degree of phenotypic plasticity, what kind of adaptive behavior they would have. And in the years, in the early uh, 70s, there really were, were no fish in this one pond, and you see that, again, there's no real phenotypic plasticity being shown in most lineages. A few years later, fish were introduced into this area, and we can see now that there was the development of clonal lineages that did show pretty strong behavioral responses when they sensed that fish were available. Um, so this is, we see the evolution of this plastic behavior occurring in the appropriate context of having uh, a change in the environmental uh, stimulus. There is now a selection pressure to show this appropriate behavioral response. A few years later, the fish populations have, have declined, and you do see some of that behavior in some cases, but much less so. Um, in general, you do see uh, instead that there's a lower overall phototactic behavior compared to the original population back in the 70s. But you do see that there is greater phototactic behavioral plasticity in circumstances when it is the most important for fitness to be able to uh, avoid fish in uh, a time period when there are lots of fish in the pond. We've talked about the importance of adaptations relative to fitness and how important natural selection is in molding these adaptations. But I don't want you to get the impression that all traits are adaptations. Not all traits have an adaptive function. For example, if you look at different giraffe populations, they have different spotting patterns uh, and reticulation kind of netting patterns. This is more likely due to fixation of different neutral mutations in each of these populations due to genetic drift. There's really no set pattern that probably is better than the other from a selective point of view. My favorite example is one I kind of came up with. Um, I was looking at the inside of a clamshell one time and just marveling at that beautiful mother of pearl bright coloration that's on the inside of the shell. I guarantee you if this was on the outside of these shells, someone would be making up some uh, adaptive reason why these mollusks have brightly colored shells. But, but there is absolutely no adaptive function of that coloration inside of the shell because think about it, during the life of that, those mollusks, it's dark in there. There's no way that that color could be adaptive. The color is simply a, an artifact of the chemical makeup of the inside of those shells when it is exposed to light. And so that, that color, it is a trait that we see when we crack open these shells, but there's no way that that's adaptive, the coloration itself. But even when you do demonstrate that a trait is adaptive, that it, it has some adaptive function, it may not always be perfectly adaptive. It, it's not like engineered for a, a certain degree of specificity. And there are several reasons why that may be, and I'm going to break them down in, into categories, but I want you to realize that there's kind of some overlap between these categories. One potential limit to how good an adaptation could be is that the environment is constantly changing in their time lags. So if the environment changes really quickly, faster than even generation time for an organism, the traits in the population are always going to be lagging behind in their adaptive uh, ability to catch up. So think about the example of the, 
Darwin Finch's earlier, some years big bills are better, other years small bills are better. Um, and you're not going to get a perfectly sized bill found in the majority of the individuals in the population until you have a very consistent period of time in which that is the adaptive morphology. When it's constantly changing back and forth, there's going to be time lags of the adaptive trait matching the environmental uh, challenge. Sometimes a trait uh, has trade-offs as well. So the perfect adaptation may be limited because certain aspects of it may work well in one condition, but that condition uh, doesn't serve well in, in other ways. So here's an example. If you look at begonia, flower size Bigger flowers, from the female perspective, so for attracting pollinators, the bigger the flower, boy, the more pollinator visits you're going to get. So you would think, okay, that's directional selection for producing really large flowers. But here's the problem. Across the plant, the number of flowers that you can produce is related to the size. So you can actually produce a lot more flowers if you produce small ones. So that's actually directional selection in the opposite direction. And there's going to be some intermediate flower size associated with these trade-offs into to the two different directions of selection and how it, it's pulling the evolution of female flower size in this species. Here's another example of a trade-off. So sickle cell anemia is a disease that is very problematic in individuals that have this. It causes the sickling of the red blood cells, which reduces their ability to carry oxygen and it can cause uh, circulatory problems, particularly in capillary beds, and can be very painful. So if you're a heterozygote for this, you suffer mild cases of sickle cell anemia. Now, if you're a homozygous without the sickle cell allele, then you don't have this disease. Well, clearly that seems like that ought to be how direct, uh, selection should operate in that situation then. Who wants to have sickle cell anemia? Well, it turns out if you're living in an area prone to malaria and you don't have access to medications, anti malarial medications, having one sickle cell uh, allele makes you resistant to malaria because what happens is the plasmodium, uh, if you do get an infection, as it enters the red blood cells, those are the ones that are prone to sickle uh, and then they get filtered out um, of the body and so it allows you to resist getting that disease. Okay, well that seems beneficial and if you look at homozygotes then in that situation, living in a malaria zone, they're going to be more susceptible to malaria. So see, there's, there's really no perfect uh, adaptive situation here with red blood cells. Um, if you're going to be heterozygous and resistant to malaria, well, you've got some problems with sickle cell anemia. If you're homozygous, well, you don't have problems with anemia, but you may die of malaria. So again, it's going to depend on the relative frequency of malarial infections in the area at what level you're going to maintain the sickle cell allele in the population. Now, this is a good segue into the next topic because um, just the, the genetic uh, way that this trait is set up also leads to another class of limitations to perfect adaptation, which we call genetic constraints. So just the genetics of producing heterozygotes versus homozygotes in this situation can be problematic. So for example, if you're a heterozygote and you're in a high malaria zone, that's, that's probably better in that situation, right? Because you're going to uh, resist malaria. The problem is you can't guarantee to pass that trait on to your offspring because if two heterozygotes mate, sure half of their offspring are going to be heterozygotes and have that beneficial trait as well. A quarter of them though are going to be homozygous for the sickle cell allele and that's a degree of sickle cell anemia that is definitely worse and, and it'll kill you before you could even get malaria. So that's not good. Uh, and then the other quarter of your offspring are going to be homozygous and lack the sickle cell allele and so they'll be susceptible to malaria. So just the genetics of that system provides a genetic constraint to the ability of, of producing the adaptive morphology in all your offspring. So here's another example of a genetic constraint, um, which is also, also a pretty good example of a time lag. If you go to the tropics, sometimes you'll see these uh, tropical trees that have these massive fruits. And as you know, fruits are adaptations for attracting animals that will eat the fruits or carry the fruits off, but regardless, they're acting as dispersal agents for the seeds. Well, in these tropical trees, some of the fruits are really too large and, and too hard, too thick skinned for the animals that live in those environments now to be able to eat. And this begs the question, well, why did these trees evolve these large fruits? It just doesn't seem like it's very adaptive. 
Well, it turns out 10,000 years ago, there were another set of mammals living in these areas, these large herbivores in the Neotropics, that probably were the dispersal agents for these fruits. However, these large herbivores have now gone extinct, and the, the fruits just rot on the ground. There are not any animals that live in the area that can successfully uh, open up these fruits and eat them. Why hasn't that happened? Because again, this was 10,000 years ago. Um, it may be a genetic constraint. There may not yet be enough time to generate the genetic variation to modify these fruit, or there may be some reasons, some other functions associated with these genes where those types of mutations that would allow for a smaller, thinner fruit would cause some other problems in the organism. Um, and so that, that there are some genetic limitations for this fruit to evolve to a more appropriate size. Here's another example of a, a genetic constraint, and this time it involves what we call pleiotropic developmental genes. A pleiotropic gene is a gene that its expression affects several traits. So for example, you might have a gene that controls the development of both legs and wings, a single gene. So you might get a mutation that pr produces longer wings, as shown here. Now that actually might be good from sexual selection uh, example that I gave earlier or because it, it allows them to fly more efficiently and find more food and mate more often. So that really would be adaptive. The problem, however, could be that if this pleiotropic developmental gene also influences the size of the legs, it may end up producing legs that are so maladaptive that uh, it takes away from the fitness advantage uh, derived from bigger wings. This, this may be such a negative aspect that it lowers the fitness of the individuals that bear this new mutation. There are other types of constraints that we can imagine. A friend of mine in her PhD defense was asked the following question. Why have animals never developed wheels? Which at first sounds like a bizarre question, but then when you think about it, wheels certainly make our lives uh, easier. Just, just think of all the applications of wheels that we have. So how has that not been beneficial to other animals as well? Well, one potential answer for that is again, the trait has to match the environment. And most environments where animals live, they're not really flat and, and wheels would not really be probably the most efficient mode of locomotion, maybe. But you can still think of plenty of environments in which it's pretty flat. So uh, salt lake beds that are just perfectly flat. Um, most beaches uh, would fit this criteria. So there are plenty of flat surfaces. So what else might explain why wheels have never evolved? Well, this professor, the answer he was looking for was a physiological constraint. If these wheels are going to be living tissue, that requires that they have a constant supply of nutrients and oxygen, which means they have to have a blood supply. Probably have to have nervous innervation of those tissues as well. How are you gonna get this going to a wheel that's constantly turning? What's gonna happen is those blood vessels and stuff are gonna be ripped apart when the wheel spins. And so that in itself might be a developmental, just physiological, anatomical constraint to the evolution of uh, structures like that. Lastly, there may be historical constraints. Uh, and this is a, kind of like a long-term example of a time lag. If you look at a lot of islands, we see the evolution of flightlessness in birds. And that means that they lose their functionality in their wings, their wings get smaller, and their bodies tend to get bigger. And this is actually adaptive for many islands because islands tend to go through some pretty drastic uh, uh, fluctuations in resource availability. So if you're a bird and you have really high metabolism, um, you, you better stock up the fat to make it through those uh, rough times. Most birds don't carry around a lot of fat because they need to fly. But if you're on an island, you don't really need to fly. You don't have any predators around, for example. You know, getting resources, everything is kind of two-dimensional. You don't need to fly. So give up flight, pack on the pounds, and that may be more adaptive in those island uh, situations. And so we see this in kiwis, we see this in dodos, flightless cormorants. However, if there is a change in the environmental circumstances, say Portuguese and Spanish and Dutch sailors land on those islands and start introducing rats and snakes to those islands so that now they have predators, you don't just re-evolve flight really quickly, okay? Because your past 
adaptive evolution to gain size, uh, gain weight, reduce the complexity of the musculature and the, the bony structures associated with wings, that may limit your potential to evolve flight again. So you may be constrained by your past evolution uh, to this flightless morphology and you may not be able to adapt fast enough to this new environment. So I've given you lots of examples of how natural selection can produce adaptations in the previous videos. The next two videos, however, are going to talk about sexual selection. I've given you some hints about how sexual selection can work in the past. But now we're going to really focus on that. And the first video is going to uh, focus on male-male competition, or uh, what it's uh, more properly termed these days is intrasexual selection. And then we'll talk about intersexual selection, which usually takes the form of a female choice.